I'd like to welcome you all to HR.com Institutes for Human Resources webcast, Developing World-Class Business Leaders in Emerging Markets, Strategic Challenges and Opportunities. My name is Leah Walling, and I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for CBP, the exclusive publisher of the Myers-Briggs Assessment and provider of global solutions for leadership and professional development, team building, conflict management, and retention. I'll be moderating today's webcast, and we'll be introducing our featured speaker, Andrew Bell, in just a moment. The webcast will explore the challenges companies face in developing a quality supply of skilled leaders who can lead effectively in their local context and as part of an international organization and global leadership team. The session will also include a discussion of the macroeconomic context and its opportunities, the leadership gap and its challenges, leadership development strategies and practices for emerging markets, and techniques for developing leaders for both local and global effectiveness. Today's webinar will run for approximately one hour, and the last 10 to 15 minutes will reserve for a Q&A. During the presentation, as you think of questions, please go ahead and submit them to me using the question function in the GoToWebinar controls. Now I'd like to introduce our featured speaker. I'm very excited to welcome Andrew Bell, Vice President of International for CPP, the exclusive publisher of the Myers-Briggs Personality Assessment. Andrew oversees operations and development of all CPP business outside the U.S. and delivers consulting, executive coaching, and development programs for clients around the world. Prior to CPP, Andrew was the founder and managing director of Hemisphere Consulting in Singapore, which was acquired by CPP in 2010, and providing HR consulting, executive coaching, and leadership development, and has worked with clients in more than 20 countries in Asia Pacific, Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Andrew also spent 22 years at Unilever in the UK, China, and Singapore, and rose to the position of Senior Vice President of Human Resources. On behalf of the Conference Board, Andrew has served as Program Director for the Asia-Pacific HR Council and Diversity and Work-Life Strategy Council, and has authored Leadership Development in Asia-Pacific, Identifying and Developing Leaders for Growth, and Redefining the Employee Value Proposition, New Developments in Asia-Pacific. Please join me in welcoming Andrew, and I'd like to turn over the webinar to him. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Leah. And hello, everybody, wherever you may be, whichever time zone and perhaps whichever country that, uh, uh, that you're in today. And let me start by saying that I have some good news, and I also have some bad news uh, for, uh, for you. The bad news is that I don't have any easy solutions or, or a template uh, that you'll be able to take away in one hour's time to have a good solution to this challenge. Um, but that's just realistic, and I should be honest about that. Um, but that's the bad news, and what's the good news? The good news is I have some facts, which should be useful for you going forward. I have some models. Um, I have some research. Um, I even have some hypotheses and some opinions. Of course, the opinions uh, may be personal. You may have different opinions. And if at any time either the facts, the models, the research, or the opinions uh, lead you to ask a question, as Leah says, uh, please enter that into the uh, dialog box. Uh, and we'll take those at the end or perhaps subsequently. I suppose the other good news is I do have some experience um, which I'll try to make relevant and, and bring to bear. Um, and ultimately, the objective is to add some value to you and to your organization as you seek to address this important topic. So my agenda for today is in uh, four parts. The first part, uh, I'll address the macroeconomic context uh, and the opportunity that that creates for all of us, uh, particularly in emerging markets. The second uh, agenda item will be to address the leadership gap, which is the challenge that is presented to us. And in that respect, I'll talk both about quantity and particularly about um, quality. The third part of the agenda is around HR strategies and uh, practices uh, for emerging markets, uh, including the role of the HR function, which uh, I think is particularly relevant to uh, how uh, able companies are to address the developing of leaders. And the fourth part of the agenda will be how can we develop leaders for global and local effectiveness. And I, I hope I can provide you with some takeaways there, um, which in some ways will be, will be helpful to you. 
But that indeed is a high order challenge. And uh, let me just tell a little uh, kind of story against myself, but I'm sure you've all heard of um, uh, this little comment, which is um, you can take the boy out of Middlesbrough. Now, Middlesbrough is my hometown in the northeast of England. And there's that lovely phrase, which is you can take the boy out of Middlesbrough, but you can't take Middlesbrough out of the boy. And the same would apply to uh, each and all of you, depending where you came from. Uh, and therefore, as we try to address regional, international, global uh, uh, initiatives, uh, we have to acknowledge uh, that we uh, look at that uh, from our own kind of inheritance and perspective. Um, so I'm just acknowledging that at this stage, that it indeed is a high order challenge to address both the global and the local. Moving to the next slide. As Leah said, CPP are particularly known as publishers of the Myers-Briggs type indicator, also of the Thomas Kilman instrument, a strong interest inventory, Biro B and CPI. And here we are looking at uh, CPP. Uh, I'm sitting at that top left photograph. Uh, my office is just up there on the right hand side. Uh, we have about 100 people here. I'm working in the international division together with Ian Purchase and Michelle Johnston. The picture on the right there, Australia. We have a wholly owned business uh, in Australia. And uh, Cameron Knott and uh, Martin Bolt uh, are sitting there in Melbourne uh, looking out at that beautiful view. We wholly own the office now, the business in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. And that's the view from Robin Robbins' office. Robin is the managing director in Singapore. And there, He and I were sitting looking down at the Formula One Grand Prix when that picture was taken. And we also now wholly own the business in New Zealand, where Brian Lawrence sits. And our objective is to seek to be a globally integrated provider so that we can help organizations, help individuals make sense both of what's local and specific, but also what's regional or global. And we do that through uh, what we like to call a federation of uh, our distributors uh, who are based all over the world, as you can uh, see on this slide. So that's our network, and uh, with them, um, we seek to uh, provide solutions uh, in addition to tools uh, to people uh, struggling or seeking to address these big issues. Now, let me go into the agenda proper. So I think we all know, we all have a perspective. We read the papers, we listen to the radio, and we know that the, the global economy, the balances are changing. Uh, at the moment, the US has the biggest uh, economy, uh, gross domestic product at purchasing power parity. Um, but this is conference board data. Uh, and we can see that uh, by 2020, China indeed may become number one. Uh, in fact, that would now be uh, uh, believed to uh, happen much earlier. And it may happen in 2014 or 2015. India also is uh, increasing in size as an economy, becoming very important. And we all have our favorite statistics which describe this changing landscape. Uh, reading the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago, it uh, made a very interesting comment about if China could spend its foreign exchange reserves, uh, what could they buy? Uh, and the answer to that was they could buy Italy. Uh, or they could buy America's 10 biggest listed companies, or Europe's 15 biggest listed companies, or, or the entire Nikkei uh, in Japan. Uh, we also hear statistics around General Motors sell more cars in China now than they do in the US. And I was particularly intrigued watching the highlights of the royal wedding uh, last week in the UK to see the Jaguar cars and the Range Rover cars and was pleased to know that they are now owned by an Indian company, Tata. So the global economy has shifted so significantly. But we should stress that the term emerging markets has to be addressed very respectfully, because in many regards, these are re-emerging markets. Uh, economic historians would suggest that India was probably the biggest economy uh, for many hundreds of years, uh, up until around the 11th, 12th century. And China was probably the biggest economy uh, until the 18th or even the early 19th century. So perhaps a more accurate term is re-emerging. Um, and as Napoleon said, uh, let China sleep, for when she awakes, she will shake the world. Um, well, perhaps reawakening. So now I'm coming on to the leadership gap and the challenge that that presents for us. I have here a couple of pictures just to add some, some color. 
uh, to the uh, to the presentation. Uh, this is uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, in Africa. And the moral of the story uh, coming from those pictures is that indeed we are focused on the horizon of increasing demand, growing our businesses uh, in emerging markets. But that's a very unpredictable uh, objective. Um, we know that it's significant, but we can't easily predict what will happen. Sometimes when we get to the horizon and across the horizon, um, we find that there is uh, turmoil or turbulence, in, in this case, a, a whirlwind coming across the Serengeti. This is personal experience, by the way. And you don't know whether that uh, whirlwind is going to come your way or not. So there are always shocks and there are surprises. Demand is high, but in unpredictable. And competition is broadening. Uh, I'll give you an example of a few years ago, I was traveling to Nigeria to do some work in the oil sector and connected to a flight in Dubai and was very surprised to find that effectively the whole plane uh, was people from China. And this, of course, a few years ago was the beginning of China's extremely, as we can now see, successful uh, moving out uh, into those uh, sectors, particularly the um, uh, commodity sectors, to secure supplies. Um, and the retention of the mobile talent pool uh, is even if we are able to uh, meet the demand and bring people in, people are now so much more mobile and the situation can be quite fluid. So with supply, may not be so much that uh, there is a problem with the quantity, uh, as we will uh, see in a moment with some further information. The challenge may be more around the quality uh, of people are that are available uh, and our ability to develop them for the kinds of roles that we have. And that includes addressing the types of competencies which are most important. And are they local competencies? Can we identify global competencies? or some hybrid with that uh, rather nice hybrid word, local, uh, to describe uh, that characteristic. And now we have some information which uh, provide facts uh, supporting this uh, notion, this view, uh, that the very unpredictability and the highly competitive environment um, makes the uh, leadership gap such a difficult challenge. This was some research done by CPP uh, a few years ago. And in response to the question, uh, what is the level of seriousness that the rapidly changing competitive environment has on leadership development plans, um, more than 75% of people are saying that it is uh, indeed uh, very serious uh, or somewhat serious. And this is the same report by CPP and another aspect of the challenge. More than 50% of people um, were reporting that the greatest challenge is unprepared people assuming higher level of positions uh, due to lack of available talent. So again, uh, the quantity may be there. It may not just be that there's a shortage of people, particularly in countries which, of course, have very high population but maybe they just aren't prepared to take on the roles uh, that companies are hoping uh, or expecting them uh, to do. And as we might expect, in terms of employee growth, the greatest expectation um, is in markets such as Asia uh, and Latin America and Africa. Uh, perhaps the uh, surprise on that particular slide uh, is the degree of increase uh, reported for North America and Europe. Um, whereby I suppose the current phrase uh, is more around jobless recoveries um, rather than um, significant uh, increases in employment rates. But clearly, uh, in the emerging markets, uh, that's where uh, the numbers undoubtedly are increasing. And now we come to a slide which reports some data from Bursin and Associates. This is a very recent um, survey, uh, just released, I think, um, uh, last month. And uh, this is identifying, indeed, the gap in the leadership pipeline uh, is a major challenge. Um, that's the first one, uh, followed by the need for new skills, uh, for new developing products, uh, changing business uh, context, and changing business climate. So again, this is reaffirming 
the scale of the challenge and the unpredictability uh, that is particularly faced uh, in the emerging markets. I well remember sitting in a room with um, a group of um, regional HR directors a few years ago uh, in Shanghai uh, and one of the organizations present had recently conducted a significant review of graduate expectations across the top universities in Asia and nearly everybody in the room bar one person was surprised to see that the uh, the low prominence uh, of the importance of having overseas work experience for graduates particularly from China um, whereas a few years previously that had been one of the main attractions and one of the main offerings by particularly the Western companies whilst recruiting in China and as the room struggled to understand why it had reduced so much over the previous five years uh, one of the participants indeed the only participant who was um, Chinese mainland national um, who's in a very senior role uh, in an international business uh, explained that the reason was that our time is now uh, a quite profound comment that uh, all of us remember uh, being expressed uh, and how different uh, that was to a few years previously where people really wanted to join perhaps a foreign owned company and move overseas whereas if our time is now uh, maybe we want to stay in China uh, maybe we want to join a Chinese company. This just uh, briefly addresses uh, the subject of uh, quantity versus quality. Uh, this piece of data comes from both the Conference Board and the China National Bureau of Statistics. And we can see on the left hand side there that uh, in 2008 after a rapid, rapid increase uh, over the previous uh, decade, um, there are now 5 million uh, graduates a year uh, coming through the Chinese system. The figure will be even higher now. Five million, of course, is higher than the population of Singapore uh, or the population of New Zealand. So very high quantity. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is uh, the number of uh, PhDs each year combined with the number of master's students. Uh, and that figure uh, is around 350,000 a year. Um, I don't have the data today for India or for Brazil, um, but I'm sure the figures are similarly large, uh, and therefore that puts our attention to thinking around the quality and the development of people rather than limitation in the supply as such. So still on the leadership gap and the challenge, um, can we as organizations define and develop competencies which are global, which then enables us uh, to develop people in a, in a consistent way uh, or to develop them to a, a level of kind of capability, competence uh, that is relevant across an organization and across uh, ge geography? And in answer to the question, has your company developed a global competency model? 57% uh, of respondents said yes and 43% of respondents said no. If we move to the next slide and we can see from the same survey, that this is a conference board survey, that um, when respondents were asked to um, explain what were the most effective practices for developing global leaders, uh, most of these are experiential um, and therefore consistent with what's often called the 70-20-10 model perhaps where 70% is experiential um, often I think referred to as perhaps the Lombardo model um, this research would um, support uh, that belief although interestingly the same survey said that isn't necessarily where uh, the investment does go um, but um, people often spend relatively more money into uh, the formal education side of development um, despite the fact that uh, so much experience, so much evidence supports that it needs to be experiential uh, to help people develop into the kind of roles that are available. And on the next slide we can see uh, a few Vox Pop type comments again from that conference board research which is around internal barriers to developing leaders. Um, 
specifically in the uh, Asia-Pacific emerging market context, but I'm sure uh, that the same would apply uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, first quote, there is a tendency to believe that whatever works in the United States should work across the globe. Perceptions in European HQ that top executives need to be hard driving. Um, and expatriates clearly, and we don't all call uh, uh, international assignees, uh, don't necessarily have the expatriate title, but nonetheless the notion of somebody coming into the country to play an important role, very important though it is, isn't often as successful uh, in the development of local succession for a range of different reasons, worthy of a, of a webcast in its own right. So we've been addressing, considering here, the leadership gap and the challenge that that presents. And now I'll move to the next part of the agenda, which is to think about how uh, HR strategies, uh, practices, and the role of the HR function, the profession, uh, can play uh, as a positive contributor. Uh, looking at you there uh, on, the, uh, on the PowerPoint uh, is a regional HR team that I used to work with. Um, we have a Malaysian, uh, a Thai, and uh, two Singaporean Chinese uh, doing what uh, HR people can quite like doing, which is uh, holding on to the money or being in control of the money with good intent. Um, and going about their work uh, across, uh, across the region, uh, seeking to do their best. Uh, so let's just consider for a while what uh, might work best in emerging markets, and how different is it um, from developed markets. So on the next slide, I thought it would be useful to, uh, to address this in the context of the employee value proposition, uh, the EVP. Um, and I've used a mnemonic here of sure, so the status of the company, HR policies, opportunities for growth, respect, and uh, the area of ethics and social responsibility. Um, you could rearrange the mnemonic uh, to uh, equally read horse, uh, but for today I decided to keep it with sure. It sounded more geographic. And EVPs can be, um, in, in concept, essentially the same wherever we go in the world. Um, but this is built up from uh, working with organizations in emerging markets. And I think uh, there's a particular, perhaps, emphasis in the way this is expressed, uh, which is relevant uh, to uh, our wish to uh, better develop people in emerging markets. The status of the company. I think is particularly important. Um, certain sectors, of course, are more attractive than other sectors. That can present challenges, uh, which can be responded to by those who are in less fashionable sectors. And organizations may do that, uh, very actively do that. Uh, otherwise, they won't be able to attract. But national identity can also be very important. Um, and that's, for international organizations, uh, something that they need to handle both in terms of their attractiveness on a transnational basis, but also an identity within the country. HR policies and HR capability I will address actually on the, on the next slide, because I think this is something we have to be particularly aware of. Opportunities for growth I will also address. Uh, just on the issue of respect and ethical and social responsibility, uh, yes, very important in markets around the world. Um, but we do tend to find that around uh, policies and initiatives towards DNI and work life is there is a very different context uh, in many emerging markets. Um, and I think companies increasingly find that although they can work to global principles and rightly work to and publicize and promote global principles, that there has perhaps been less um, rolling out uh, of those initiatives in a coordinated and consistent way um, because it's important to take into account uh, the local context. And when it comes to perhaps DNI, that would include uh, those themes, those uh, issues uh, being addressed less in the public domain, perhaps more in the private domain, and with less regulatory uh, framework. So uh, more. Uh, thought of 
points of emphasis uh, within the EVP that may be particularly relevant in the emerging market context. Now let me uh, delve deeper into the issue of HR policies and HR capability. And some years ago when I was in uh, the HR role, regional HR role with Unilever, we used to run leadership development programs uh, in Bali in uh, Indonesia, beautiful, beautiful island in Indonesia. And uh, I remember so clearly uh, turning up at one particular program which had 30 high potentials from across the Asia-Pacific region. Um, and I decided, uh, perhaps somewhat recklessly, to engage in some informal 360 feedback uh, around the HR function for which I was responsible. Uh, and I freely uh, asked people to uh, write down on um, post-it notes uh, any uh, negative connotation that they may, perhaps even amusingly or profoundly, uh, give to the letters H and R. I also asked them to then also do the same exercise, but with a very positive mindset. Um, the cynical type responses, uh, which you can see there, human remains, head of redundancy, horrible relations, highly rigid, uh, we can smile at. Um, and they were being expressed in, in if you like, in good spirit. Um, but nonetheless, uh, many were expressed. Uh, and although on this slide we have four from the cynics and four from the optimists, uh, the optimists uh, identified huge rewards, harmonious relations, help required and helps results, uh, although I'm afraid to uh, confess uh, that the cynics outnumbered the optimists in terms of their responses. Now, that's not unique to Asia, um, but I think a particular aspect in many emerging markets is the status, the position, the professionalism um, of, the, uh, of the HR function. And moving to the next slide, where we have a picture of uh, Mount Kinabalu uh, on the island of Borneo, so um, the state of Sabah uh, in Malaysia. Um, we've seen uh, this obviously is, is similar to and very much based on the work of, of Ulrich, the Ulrich model, and the different roles that HR can play and develop into. And it is prog it's progressive going up the mountain, uh, if you like. Um, and it can be much more difficult uh, in emerging markets for HR to play the more higher added value roles simply because of the status of the function, uh, the experience and the skill set uh, of the people in the function. Um, that's changing, and many big companies are very positively investing and contributing uh, to the development of the profession, but we have to be realistic uh, about that being uh, a, a factor. So a um, concluding slide around the role of uh, HR. Um, there are many similarities across the world, uh, but there are points of emphasis which need to be taken into account in emerging markets. So perhaps it's not fundamentally different, uh, but it can be approached in a focused way. Some people would say, but it all seems to be about money. Um, inflation is high. Salary inflation is high. Retention rates are very difficult to hold, there's high turnover. But no, it's not all about money. Um, I used to take the uh, work of Maslow and Hertzberg, and I would take the, the Hertzberg motivational factors uh, and the, the, the range of factors that, that Hertzberg would address and uh, sample people uh, in programs. And their response rates were very similar uh, to that that uh, was reported uh, in Hertzberg's original work. Um, which is that, uh, indeed, money is more of a hygiene factor uh, wherever we go in the world, um, and it's personal, professional development and opportunities um, that are still most important. So here we have my colleagues happily throwing the money away um, so that we don't uh, give it uh, too much uh, overemphasis um, and that we still, um, or we, as we would anywhere in the world, we pay as much attention to the longer-term aspects of development and opportunities for people, uh, rather than uh, taking too short-term a view uh, on uh, just resolving uh, the issue uh, with money. So I now move to the um, fourth part of the agenda, um, the final section, which is, well, how can we develop uh, leaders most effectively uh, for global and local effectiveness? 
And I feel that there is a, a conundrum here. And should we be looking to develop people for a global consistency, or are there specific and unique local differences? So let me um, work uh, into why I feel that this is a conundrum, but um, also just flag that I do feel there is a way uh, that we can work on both these aspects. So this is a survey uh, conducted by the conference board, um, and you saw this uh, pie chart earlier. 57% um, of people had developed a global competency model. And they were also then asked, uh, what were the three most important company-wide competencies? We can uh, see them written here. And there is broad agreement and similarity uh, when that kind of survey and uh, uh, exploration with, with companies is done. And, and meta-research on competency models, um, I've heard people say that 80% of competency models are broadly the same um, because the organizations are seeking to address uh, similar challenges, similar issues. Of course, it's important that they are developed specifically to each company because matters of vocabulary and, and language and um, organizational evolution can be embraced within the wording. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it would appear uh, that the competencies can be expressed uh, in a fairly kind of global, broad brush way. But this is where the conundrum develops on the next slide. The first pie chart we see here, the respondents are strongly saying that leadership skills and competencies are transferable between locations. But when we look at the next pie chart, in response to the question if leaders are effective locally, will they be effective internationally? Well, 73% say, well, no, or we're not sure. And the next pie chart, the question is, if leaders are effective in one region, will they be effective in another? 67% mm -hmm. of people say, well, no, or we're not sure. So I find this quite fascinating because there is a disconnect between the pie chart at the top and the previous slide, perhaps, uh, and these two. And this is a hypothesis. You will have your own opinion on this. But I think what it is, and being a, an HR professional for a long time, I can see that I can do this, is that the model is valid. The model is transferable. We do believe that we can develop consistent common competency models and that the model is transferable between locations. But when it comes to individuals, it gets more complicated. And the reality of individuals' capability, um, as I said against myself earlier, you can take the boy out of Middlesbrough, but you can't take Middlesbrough out of the boy. We just find it very difficult, perhaps, uh, to develop people uh, to achieve, uh, to meet the expectations of a transferable globally relevant competency framework. So moving to the next slide, how to resolve the conundrum. Now here we have some rather endearing South African ostriches. And the three questions on the slide about resolving the conundrum, I can answer those from my own perspective as no, we shouldn't bury our heads in the sand. Yes. We can identify some universal building blocks and competencies. And yes, um, it makes all sense to then help people develop uh, towards those competencies, uh, including uh, them learning um, um, adaptive behaviors and uh, that would work across a range of contexts and cultures. It is, by the way, a myth that uh, ostriches uh, bury their heads in the sand. They are falsely accused. Uh, they don't do that uh, when they're panicking or when they're avoiding danger. Uh, they just run very fast uh, in the other direction. Um, but whichever it is they actually do, uh, we shouldn't be doing that because uh, we can find a productive way forward. And on the next slide, we see um, a model um, developed uh, by Robert Devine in a CPP uh, white paper a few years ago, which is seeking to identify what the 
universal, universal building blocks and competencies might be. And you can see that this is very similar to what we were sharing earlier from the feedback from the conference board survey around some of the universal building blocks and also, of course, identifying uh, the need to put that into the context of the situation uh, and what the business objectives are. So to the next slide, here's a view on some universal competencies that we can then address both globally uh, and locally and, and globally. And they are sequential. And that it would seem to be that for any leader anywhere in the world, um, improved understanding of self um, is an important entry point, significant um, entry point, and is always can be improved upon. So these things don't happen and then they're complete. Uh, it can need revisiting uh, over one's career. From improved understanding of self, then we can move to improved understanding of others, both their similarities and their differences. And from there, we can think more about communicating and working more effectively with others. Um, and then from there to an even higher order, which is around improving organizational performance. And there are five uh, themes or aspects there. And indeed, there are others, of course, such as uh, project management or change or uh, approaches towards coaching. So how can we move towards helping people uh, move uh, through that, uh, if you like, development sequence. Uh, the work of uh, Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, the founder of analytical psychology who died in 1961, so working through the first part of the first half of the previous century, developed the model of psychological types. And on to the next slide, we can see how uh, in the Myers-Briggs type indicator uh, that um, uh, Jungian model um, was developed and refined by the mother and daughter team of Catherine Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers um, to develop the four dichotomies uh, that are used or aspects of personality that are used within the MBTI model. I'll move through this fairly quickly to uh, get onto a, an application of how it's used. But the four dichotomies are extroversion, introversion, focus of our energy, Sensing and intuition, the core mental process of how we prefer to take in information. Thinking and feeling, core mental process around how we make decisions. And judging, perceiving about how we uh, seek to organize our life externally. And that leads to uh, 16 broad personality types. And let me quickly say that, of course, every individual is unique, um, but the advantage of using a framework such as this. And of course, there are other frameworks and models available. But the advantage of using them is that it makes sense of a very, very complex situation. And we can't deal with too many conundrums. Um, so it helps to have the framework uh, that people can um, learn from. I personally am sitting in the INTJ, Broad Personality Type. And a significant learning for me uh, has been working uh, both uh, in, in work and also in my life, uh, my personal life, with people of different preferences. I have work colleagues. I also have family member uh, who is ESFP. And that's been significant learning for me um, that I can also then use uh, in each cultural context. And what I'd just like to share with you today is, is a specific application. Uh, of how we've been able to use that uh, developing leaders uh, in a global organization. Um, this is uh, a lot of information on this slide, but uh, this is ways of looking at uh, personality preferences uh, based off MBTI. And uh, with a particular client, with many clients, uh, we would spend at least half a day arriving or helping individuals uh, determine their own personality preferences. But from there, work with the team or work with the leadership group to apply that within their own organization. And a very good way of doing that is working with these lenses. Um, this helps people identify both, obviously, their strengths and what's working well, but also perhaps what certain points of friction or areas of improvement might be. And if we use to the move to the 
next slide, I can show you a, a real example uh, where we've taken the quadrants lens and used this. This was working with a, a large international organization a couple of months ago. Um, they are headquartered in Asia. They're an Asian-based um, transnational organization. And they were holding uh, their leadership development program um, for their uh, business heads, their country heads and their business unit heads. And the individuals came from Asia, from Latin America, from Central America, from North America, uh, and from Europe. And this is the type distribution uh, for that group of, of leaders. And if I just ask you to look to the box on the right there, where it talks about the lens distribution, after the individuals had determined their own type, we could then profile it through this lens. And we can see that three of them had a particular preference of IN in the first two letters. Eight had an EN preference combination. Four had ES, one had IS. Now, without going into this in uh, too great a detail, um, what we can um, observe from this, or what the, what the group were able to interpret for themselves, is that their particular area of strength was around thoughtful innovation and action-oriented innovation. Um, they were not as strong at putting systems and processes into place. And this was something that they had received feedback from previously but hadn't really had a framework for understanding what that meant. And in fact, the source of the friction wasn't so much about the different geographies or the emerging markets or the developed markets. That sometimes provided the way in which people thought there were problems, but actually the underlying uh, learning was it was more about their particular preferences and how they went about their leadership roles. And on the next slide, uh, we can see using a different lens. This is using the leadership lens, uh, which focuses uh, onto the uh, last two um, parts of the, um, the last two dichotomies, the decision-making uh, dichotomy of thinking and feeling and the orientation of, of one's life around judging and perceiving. And again, if we look at the box on the right-hand side there, we can see that of the 16 people, 13 of them, that's more than 80% of them, had a TJ preference. Now, I don't want to stereotype and I don't want to oversimplify, but one descriptor that can be given to the TJ preference can be that a particular effectiveness and preference towards logical decision making. Um, perhaps TP, we might say that an innovative exploration uh, to FP, perhaps more harmonious improvisation uh, to FJ, perhaps value-based decision-making. So this data was very interesting to the group. And what we were able to uh, share with them is that that is not untypical of many leadership teams um, around the world. Uh, the next slide shows some data from uh, Center for Creative Leadership, more than 26,000 people. And we can see at the bottom right there that 58% of that sample were reporting a preference for TJ. Uh, the next set of data comes from uh, the Ashridge Management College in the UK. Again, look at the bottom right, please, and you'll see that 58% were reporting a TJ preference. The next uh, sample group um, is a large group of Indian managers uh, in the technical fields. Again, the TJ preference grouping was 71%. And another set of data uh, comes from a global electronics company. And again, we can see that 65% are reporting the TJ preference. Now, this was very, very helpful data for the group to see that in many respects, they aren't different um, to others, um, or at least not different to uh, others who are in leadership roles, although Clearly, some of those individuals were different, and we were able to explore that with them. But overall, there was uh, some similarity in approach. The big difference, indeed, is between the proportion of uh, the TJ combination in populations at large. In the population at large, uh, perhaps around 25% of people would have the TJ combination. But this particular leadership group was therefore quite different and the learning for them was to have greater clarity 
around uh, how that would play itself out um, in their decision making and perhaps, or particularly, the implementation uh, of uh, the decisions uh, that they'd arrived at. So the kind of data that we could share with them on the next slide, um, TJ leaders likely strengths in leadership, I wouldn't just show them that information without them first uh, in a syndicate exploring what they might be and when the syndicate does that work uh, they arrive at information um, which is very similar to this. This is how they would perceive their strengths. So logical analysis and decision making being decisive. But we must acknowledge that there can be a different expression uh, according to cultural context. And that's something that we uh, would certainly explore uh, with that group, did explore with that group. Um, there were certain people um, who would, in a very self-confident and individualistic way, uh, express um, their behaviors uh, as a leader. Um, there are others, and this is neither right nor wrong, just different, who perhaps because of cultural context, but not uniquely cultural context, may be quite humble or more collectivist uh, in the expression uh, of themselves as a leader. And on the next slide, just exploring what the ha perhaps the possible weaknesses are um, of the TJ leader preference. Now, let me quickly say, some people don't like to see the use of the word weakness, and I acknowledge that. It's a word I tend to use when I'm working with people, but um, we could call that development opportunities, opportunities for improvement. And again, these can be expressed differently by cultural context. Uh, so, for example, it might be uh, that some people turn up the volume or become yet more assertive um, when they're in an area of, of difficulty or challenge or perhaps of stress. Um, an alternative tendency might to become uh, more secretive or to be avoiding or withdrawn uh, and to uh, remove uh, from um, interaction uh, with people. Again, that may be to do with individual style, um, but it can also have a cultural context. So I'm moving to the last uh, two uh, slides uh, before perhaps we uh, can take some questions. Uh, and maybe I'll just do a, a little summary at this point. But what I'm, of course, seeking to address is that I do think we can develop leaders for global and local effectiveness by helping them have a framework uh, that understands uh, both themselves, others, and dynamics within teams. Um, but to also acknowledge that along with any framework, whichever framework may be used, we also have to be aware of different um, dynamics uh, that are playing an influence. Uh, and one of those is cultural norms. Um, I can give a, a number of examples personally where uh, that is still learning that I need to have. I was in Mexico just a few weeks ago. And uh, I still have a challenge with uh, approaches to time, the more flexible approaches to time. I took my guest out for lunch at 12.30 um, for quite an important meeting, um, but the restaurant didn't open till 1.30. Uh, so uh, all my plans uh, had to then become more flexible. Um, he, however, was uh, far more accommodating of that. He'd obviously been expecting that that would be the case, uh, and in fact the whole uh, meeting then happened in the restaurant through the rest of the afternoon. So he may, I wasn't uh, profiling him in MBTI, perhaps he had similar MBTI preferences or personality preferences to mine, but would naturally uh, experience them and play them out quite differently uh, given that uh, different cultural context. One of the advantages of MBTI and other good instruments that work this way, um, and this is a specific example of MBTI a few months ago, we were able to work out that people had used uh, that tool uh, in 178 different countries. Um, one reason for that is because it's available in many languages. Um, and I'm sure the main underlying reason uh, is it's because people do feel that it provides 
a, a good uh, underlying uh, framework uh, that can be used both for local and, and um, regional global uh, development uh, objectives. So we have here the, uh, the Afghanistan flag and the Zimbabwean flag um, to, uh, to acknowledge uh, that it, indeed it was used from A to Z and uh, about 178 countries in between. And so my final slide. Uh, what have I sought to cover? I've, I've sought to address the fact that the opportunities are enormous, uh, but naturally there are many challenges. And in evaluating that, we must evaluate both numerically and qualitatively in terms of how we respond to them. I think of particular importance is how we develop HR capability. Of course, we would like fewer cynics uh, and more optimists. Um, we can work with appropriate EVPs um, uh, in each market, and we also need to support the uh, HR function uh, to uh, better support the needs of the business, the needs of the organization. We can seek to define what's universal. We can seek to do that with good intent, but also always acknowledge the differences. Uh, therefore, we shouldn't be burying our heads in the sand, but neither should we be claiming that it's easier or more simplistic than reality suggests. So in some way, we need to embrace the conundrum or acknowledge the complexity. And one way forward is to find a common language and a common process, a framework indeed, which enables to better understand self, better understand others, communicate more effectively, recognize and adapt to different cultural and different situational contexts, and of course, uh, ultimately, in addition to personal and professional development for people, uh, increase organizational performance. So Leah, that's the material I had to share, and I'll just uh, hand over back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew. We really, uh, I really enjoyed that personally. So uh, I'd like to move into some Q&A. Um, we've got a, a few questions that have come in, and I think we probably have time to, uh, to hit a couple of them. So this one comes in from Nan. Uh, she, she's asking, is it easier to work with the uh, MBTI assessment in some cultures and countries uh, than in others? Yeah. Um. The answer to that is yes, in my opinion, um, but there's two different types of yes. Um, the individual yes is I think each of us has a greater effectiveness in some cultures than others, and therefore inevitably um, we aren't equally skilled, equally able. And it might be that I personally uh, can work in certain countries more easily than others because of an affinity, perhaps some personal experience, some work experience, and therefore, at an individual level, it, that might be any country. The more general uh, answer would be that given that MBTI is seeking to help people identify who their true underlying self or preferences are, then the more general observation can be that that's more difficult to do in collectivist cultures than it is in individualistic cultures. Um, and therefore, perhaps uh, in an Australia uh, or a United States, um, it may be easier to work with individuals and have them arrive at their uh, MBTI preference than it would be in a country where the collectivist norm um, limits uh, or curtails um, the possibility for people to, to work that through. So that would be my response to that question. Excellent. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. So Matt has a question. Um, he's interested in how you strike the balance in training between acculturating local leaders into global uh, company culture and then helping them understand and direct the local employee base. Yes. Well, the fact that I'm pausing shows that it's a, a very good uh, and difficult question. <sighs> Organizations who I think do this best have developed their approach over many, many years. And therefore, 
early in the development uh, intervention, the development programs, uh, the focus is perhaps more local. So at the more junior levels, the high potential levels, first of all, it's helping people be effective in the local context. But slowly or gradually uh, bringing in the more regional or uh, international dynamic. And so by the time it gets to perhaps five years in, 10 years in, and in parallel with the evolving responsibility of the individual, uh, then that uh, development program uh, is considering these wider uh, contexts. So I think it's, it's progressive. What's very difficult then is for people who then join the organization mid-career. Uh, and if they've worked for a very large but uh, monocultural or a very large company that only operates in one market, and then suddenly find themselves in an organization which is working multinationally, transnationally, uh, then indeed it can be significant learning. But I do always still come back to that 70-20-10 um, type model, which is it's through experience that people best develop. Uh, the use of a tool or an instrument is just to provide a framework on which to then explore with them and reinforce the learning that they've had um, through those experiences. Terrific. Thank you. That that was uh, that was it is a complex co uh, question. So we started a little bit late. I'm thinking that we have one time for just one more question. Deb has a question. She's curious. Are you seeing a trend towards more localized leadership? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, most organizations that that um, I interact with are, are actively trying to do that. Um, and the reasons are many. Um, the best reasons is that um, would, of course, be that uh, those leaders uh, better understand the needs of that particular market. Um, there are also reasons, inevitably, of, of cost um, and of continuity uh, and of succession, um, and that uh, building a local cadre of people uh, is better in the long run for the country. Again, however, it comes to something of a conundrum, which is that international organizations, though, if all they do is localize, uh, how do we also then build in uh, the learning of um, more international experience? So perhaps not just localized, but it's uh, another way of expressing it is that uh, every country should be able to um, have a cadre of people such that there are as many of those people can work out of the country um, in some kind of um, equilibrium. So if I go back to my, my Unilever days, there were certain countries who were net exporters of talent um, around the world, and that was very successful. Um, but other countries where no talent was uh, coming out, and that's unfortunate. So they may have had strong local management teams, um, but it was very difficult to make that talent mobile. So yes, significant increase in localization, uh, but not at the expense of um, uh, developing a regionally or internationally a capable group of managers. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Andrew, it looks like we've come to the end, to, end of the webcast, and so I'd like to thank you very much for speaking with us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh huh. I'd also like to thank the members of our audience for attending and asking so many great questions. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get to all of them. If you have additional questions or uh, would like to learn more about CPP, you can contact us at our website at www.cpp.com, or you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Thank you again, everyone, and I hope you all have a great day.